And if anyone's on here who doesn't know who I am, I am Lorraine Benick, your compliance officer. And what I'm going to talk about today is um, some of the changes that have happened to a few of our forms. There we go. And I'm going to cover a couple of other forms too that I believe you're going to start seeing very soon. These aren't all addenda, but um, but they're notices and addenda mixed in here. So the first one I want to talk about is the residential real estate listing agreement, um, your exclusive right to sell. That has changed recently and you can tell this because if you go down to the bottom in the left-hand corner, you can see that the date is now 5-1-20. Um, that is the newest form. So that's the one that you want to be using. The big change on it is simply in paragraph six, there are two changes in paragraph six. The first one is that if the property is publicly marketed, MLS rules require the broker to file the listing with the MLS within one business day. That is 24 hours, period. If it was marketed on Saturday, then it would mean Monday. You would have to have it up by Monday because it is business days. Um, but public marketing includes flyers, yard signs, digital marketing on any public facing website, uh, brokerage website displays, digital communication marketing, which would be your email blast or your text blast, uh, multi-brokerage listing sharing networks, and any other application available to the general public. So if you're standing in the hall and you say to Karen, hey, um, I've got this listing that's coming soon, and I just wanted you to know about it because you might have the buyer for it, that's fine inside the market center only to other marketing other agents within our brokerage but if it's any way public meaning if um a member of old republic title is standing next to karen when you do that you have now publicly marketed to someone outside of the market center so be very aware of that you can do no public marketing unless you are putting it in MLS within one day. All of this has to do with the clear cooperation legislation that was passed. And this is how our MLS has decided to deal with this. Okay, there's one other paragraph where they mention it again, also under six, but it is under 6A2 where the broker will not file this listing with a multiple listing service. If that is true, what it's saying is you have to acknowledge, Mr. Seller, that you understand that if even you as the owner market this to the public, then your broker is required to add it to the MLS within one business day. So that's something you may want to point out to your sellers if they do choose, they don't want it on the internet, they don't want it on multiple listing. It's something you really need to point out now that even they can't go and market it, send out email blasts to family and friends or anything else because it will have to go on MLS. Are there any questions about that? Fernanda had a question. Can we put it on the Facebook forum? Only on, yes, on the premier Facebook forum you can because there's no one that's allowed on that forum except those who are in our market center. Uh, we once had um, different vendors on there, but we've since restricted their, them from using it. So we can now use that. I want to show you this next form as well because it's an addendum to the listing agreement. It's an exclusive agency addendum to the listing. If you go to take a listing and you're talking to the sellers and they say, I've already shown my house to Joe Smith and I don't want to include him in that listing. I want to exclude him from it. So if he comes back to me and says, I want to buy your house, then um, we'll negotiate what our fees are, but it won't be within your listing agreement. And you can exclude people that way. That is what this form is used for. So 
because of that, it was changed along with the listing agreement. If you look at G, it says public marketing. The owner may publicly market the property with signs, newspaper, internet, or whatever y'all agree to, um, but understand again, the broker must file it with the MLS within 24 hours if that happens, okay? Yes, um, you can get this form in DocuSign, you can get it in uh, zip forms, you can get it in .lu, I actually have uh, this folder that I've created. I created it years ago in dot loop and I went and recreated it in zip forms to see how easy it would be to do and then recreated in DocuSign as well. And I found that all the forms were in each of those um, document storage facilities, so. You can probably also get them from HAR from their forms cabinet. You could probably get it from HAR or you could go to um, the Texas Realtors Association website and you would be able to find it there as well. Anything they put out, you can find there. So if there are no more questions, we're gonna move on to the seller's disclosure because they did make some changes to it as well. Again, this is not an addendum, but I wanted to update you on anything that they've changed recently. This one was changed back, if you look at the date, Always in the lower left-hand corner, it will give you the TXR number and the date. This one is 9119. And the big change they made to this one was on page, catch up with me computer. Sorry about that. On page three. And the reason they did this had a lot to do with Harvey and the May Day flood and the Memorial Day flood, all of those things. Um, where people never flooded before and now they have. So a lot of people were afraid to purchase homes because they had no idea if it had had water intrusion before. This is what they changed. Um, this entire section five is about flood insurance, um, flood because of the reservoir, uh, flood because of a natural event, being Harvey. Um, water penetration due to a natural flood event, being in a floodplain, whether it's the 100, the 500, a floodway, a flood pool, a reservoir. If they answer yes to any of that, they must disclose what that flood event was and why. I have Hi. seen people also put, I'm sorry, I have seen people also put here, please see um, addendum and do a whole page of explanation of what happened and attach it to their seller's disclosure. Karen, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, that was my question. And also, I'm sure you are getting some that were flooded that are selling now. Uh, do you get, or do you have to ask for the TXR 1414? Are they doing their diligence and putting that with it? Nine times out of 10, you have to ask for it. I rarely see it attached. So if they've checked um, the first line, the third line, the fourth, or the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, <laughs> all of those, <laughs> it's not all the lines, but most of them, I think there's only three that they don't have to attach it. So if you see anything checked yes on here, uh, go back and ask them, do you have the TXR 1414? Most of them won't even know what it is. Go ahead and send it over to them. Um, and get that seller to fill that out because you're going to need that. Okay, once you've said yes, this was the flood event, this is what happened, here's what I did, um, then it's gonna ask you a couple of more questions about if there was a claim filed and um, if you received assistance from FEMA or the Small Business Administration. I found that in almost everyone that has checked yes here, they have also had to add an addendum or uh, a, an additional exhibit in order to explain all of that. It doesn't fit in the three little lines. Harvey was a, a major event, so was the May Day and the Memorial Day floods. So they can't really be explained in three little lines. So um, there will usually be a, attached sheets here, okay? 
I also wanted to remind you that now we accept electronic signatures from your sellers on the um, seller's disclosure. When we first um, had the capability several years ago now to fill out the seller's disclosure, there were a number of lawsuits uh, about the electronic signatures and uh, they accused lawyer, I'm sorry, they, they accused uh, the agents of filling it out for the seller and there was no way to prove that you didn't. At this time, um, the tracking of signatures is much better and we can upload proof of who signed when and who signed what. And there's also um, a couple of things out there like Seller Shield, I believe is the name of one of them, where you have um, protection. It's sent to the sellers, it's filled out through their program and it shows that the agent didn't fill any of this out. On the, the subject of filling out the seller's disclosure, you cannot, it, you cannot sit with the seller and say, oh, check no here. Oh, write this here. That's you filling it out, whether you realize it or not. And when that's challenged in court, um, the agent will almost always lose. So instead you can say, I'm sorry, I can't fill that out for you. What it means here is this, but that's about it. Beyond that, you need to refer them to a lawyer um, because we cannot explain beyond the, you know, is it located in a propane, propane gas system? I can say a propane gas system is much like center point where they push gas to your house, but in this case, it would be propane. Are you in a system like that? And if they say, well, no, okay, then they can check no. So I can explain to them what a propane gas system is, but I can't tell them whether to check yes or no. Okay, so be very careful when you're doing that. I attended a uh, legal, update, legal update not too long ago, and that seems to be the point that is um, in, in the courtrooms right now. That's the argument that lawyers are making is that we're, we're telling them what to put. So you don't want to put yourself in a situation where it would look like you are doing that. Any questions about the seller's disclosure? That's a very valid point, um, Lorraine, because you know, when it says gas fixtures, plumbing, you know, okay, they need to ask you, what is it, do I have, what is a gas fixture? You know, indoor plumbing, well, yeah, we're gonna, there might be some that don't have plumbing. And so yes, explaining what that means does help tremendously. And there's no problem with you explaining what any of the words on here mean or what the intent right there is. Um, you know, what do you mean by a military installation? Will they mean, are you near a military base? You know, it's okay to do that. It's not okay to say, oh, there's not a military base near here. Just check. No, you can't do that. And that's the difference. All right. One other thing about the seller's disclosure, um, you can Google the law. Uh, in the Texas Property Code, in the Texas Water Code, there are 11 people who are exempt from giving a seller's disclosure. Most of them have to do with banks or lenders or Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, or any of their employees. Um, they are all exempt from giving a uh, seller's disclosure. And the reason I'm telling you that is because with 8% of our um, Mortgages is now in forbearance in the coming months, I would say um, three to six months from now, you may be seeing some foreclosures. Foreclosures are owned by lenders, they're owned by banks, or they're owned by the federal government. None of them are required to give you seller's disclosures. So keep that in mind. A trustee is not required to give you a seller's disclosure. If the mother is selling it to the son, the direct line of consanguinity, they're not required to give it either. And if it's an estate, they're not required to give one. Who is not exempt is an investor. I hear this all the time. They're an investor, 
they've never lived in the house, they're not required. According to the Texas Property Code and the Water Code, they are. They are not exempt. So your investors still have to give it, even if they check, I don't know, to everything. They still have to give a seller's disclosure. Now, think about it. If I'm an investor and my tenant has said, hey, I need the air conditioner fixed. Hey, I need the water fixed. Hey, there's a leak under the faucet. I know things, okay? Even though I never lived there, I know things. So that's the reason they're not exempt is because they often know something about the house even if they've never lived there. Um, I was gonna say one other thing about that and it just slipped my mind. But um, if you have any doubt about whether somebody needs to give you a seller's disclosure or not, just email me. I'll be happy to tell you, or you can Google it yourself. And I have a copy of it that I keep just so I can turn around and look at it whenever I want to. The other thing is that even though they're not required to give a seller's disclosure, if they know something about the house, they are still legally responsible for that information. So if they know the pipe leaks and they don't disclose, even though they're not required to disclose um, on a seller's disclosure, they need to let you know that there is this issue. Um, Leslie asked if they're aware of an issue and a renter moves out, do they have to disclose to the next renter? Um, renting and, and selling is different, but honestly, if there's an issue with the home, they, their best bet is to disclose it because renters come back and sue too. So um, I'm, I'm all for disclose, 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 whether it's a rent situation or a, um, uh, a purchase, okay? So I'm gonna move but along. Yes. No seller's disclosure is necessary for a lease. No, there's not. Mm -hmm. But the, the question was really, if there's um, a problem. Yeah, is there going to be a problem? And there could be a problem if you don't disclose something like that. If, you know, if I've looked at the house and I think it's all great mm -hmm. and I go in there and two days later, I find that the bathtub leaks and the floors uh, weak under the bathtub, I'm not going to be a very happy camper and I'm not going to want to keep renting that house and I'm probably going to go call me a lawyer. So um, let's not get in that situation if we can prevent it. Lawyers are useful. Um, but they're not people I want to visit. Mm -hmm. So try to stay away from them. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you about the short sell addendum. Uh, Michelle did a whole class on it the other day, and I hope you attended. If you didn't, this is going to be a very condensed class on it. I'm only going to spend five to 10 minutes on it. But what happens is Mr. Homeowner has been making his note and he loses his job during COVID-19. He can't get a forbearance from the bank for whatever reason. So he's not making his note. And this goes on for about three months and now he's starting to get desperate, desperate because they're telling him, if you don't pay this note soon, you're gonna go into foreclosure. And there's a lot of pressure on him. So he has a friend in real estate and his friend calls him and just checking in on what's going on. And he says to him, you know, I'm behind on my note and I'm really thinking about selling my house so I don't lose everything. Okay, how can he do that when he owes money um, and he's behind on his note? What he can do if the bank or the lender will agree to it is what's called a short sale. And in a short sale, there's more owned owed on the property than he can pay, okay? Um, your net proceeds are gonna be less than the seller's expenses under paragraph 12 of the contract, okay? That's when you would use a short sale. In a short sale, the bank has to give consent. And the, the buyer can say, if the seller does not notify the buyer that the seller has obtained the lien holder's consent on or before this date, the contract will terminate and the earnest money goes back to the buyer. If he can before that date, this no longer applies. 
So let's say we put it under contract now, and I say 30 days from now, that seller needs to have approval of his bank. I will tell you it could be 30, 60, or 90 days, depending on the bank. They're very slow sometimes to agree to do this. But once they agree, they want to close very quickly. So if you have a buyer that's willing to do a short sale, then think about having his finances all done and all ready to go as soon as the uh, lien holder has consented. Uh, like I said, it can take them a while, but once they do that, they want to move very quickly. Okay. Um, if the lien holder refuses or withdraws their consent, then this contract also terminates and the earnest money is refunded to the buyer. Um, in all the short sales that I've done, I've only had one where the lien holder took their consent back. Most of the time they're going to consent to it and they're going to carry through to the close. Um, it's very rare that they take that consent back once they've already done it. However, if the short sale department and the foreclosure department mm -hmm. are not talking to each other, there could be an issue. And the issue is this foreclosure is going on and the short sales going on, who gets to the finish line first? And we have had it where the, the property was foreclosed on a week before it was supposed to close in a short sale. So one of the things that you have to be very careful about is finding someone in the lending institute that you can talk to who can make that decision in order to stop the foreclosure. Now, it may mean that your seller has already talked to a banker and they're the one doing the foreclosure. You may be able to talk, them as, uh, talk to them as well and stop that foreclosure so that the short sale can continue. So even though you have bank approval, make sure that you're talking to both departments so that you can stop the foreclosure if that's going on. Um, there's one other thing. Let's talk about the dates and times. This gets very confusing. I don't have it on here. Where is it? I did it on this one. Okay. I didn't add that uh, notice. But on a, on a short sale, how do you figure out the time for the option period? And I'm going to give you a quick formula. All right. I want you to write down these dates. If we agreed to the short sale, we executed the contract, the date was April 10th. I delivered the option money on mm -hmm. April 12th. So now I have an option period, okay? If you don't deliver the option money and the earnest money in a short sale, then you have no deal. You have to deliver those two things. You don't have to fulfill any other piece of the contract at that time, but you do have to deliver your option money in order to have an option period. You do have to deliver your earnest money in order to have a contract. So we've done that April 12th. Now we have an option period. The bank agrees to do this short sale on April 24th. So I started with the effective date of April 10th. But now I'm going to amend the effective date to April 24th. And I'm going to have a 10 day option period and it will now end on May 4th. Any questions? So I'm gonna go through the dates one more time. What do we have to do April to- April 10th. Oh. That's, okay. That's okay, go ahead and ask. What do we- what do we have to do to amend the executed date? There is a notice from the seller to the buyer that um, I thought I included here and I did not. So let's go back and grab it. No, oh, that's for that one. Where is the short sale? Uh, 
I'll show you the note. I don't have it in here. So let me show you the notice for the removal of a backup. It's very similar. I'm basically saying here, hey, we're removing that and the effective date is amended to. It has the same verbiage in the um, seller's notice to remove the, the short sale contingency. So we would send them that with the amended date. I'll get you the, um, the form number because I thought I had it here, but I don't. Um, but you just amend it with the, the notice and you put the amended date in. So we started with an effective date of April the 10th. We delivered our option money. We had a 10 day option period according to the contract. So we amended on the 24th when the lender said, hey, we can do the short sale. We will do this. So now our new date is the 24th and we count 10 days from there. We have till the 4th of May. That means any time from when we executed the contract on April 10th all the way to May 4th, the buyer can say, you know what, I don't want to wait anymore. I don't want to do the short sale for any reason whatsoever. Okay. It's one of the few times when you're going to have a lot longer um, option period than just the standard 10 days. Question. Any questions? Yes. Can, can they do inspections during the time they're waiting or should they? They can. They can. But that is really up to the buyer because if the lender hasn't approved it, the lender could come back and say, we're not going to do this short sale and they're out their money. They're not going to get that back. They're only going to get their earnest money back. So what I've seen in most short sales I've done is they wait until they have approval. They immediately do the inspection. They have somebody you know lined up to do it. Um, in a short sale, they are most likely not going to do any repairs unless it is a health and safety issue and the bank is going to have to do it. The bank will not consider putting antioxidant paste on the, in the electrical box. It's not going to change to GCF plugs. They're not going to recock the windows. They're just not going to do any of that stuff. They're already losing money. They're trying to mitigate their losses. They're not going to do a lot of repairs, if any. So let your buyers know that in the beginning before they even offer on the property that repairs are simply not going to be done unless it's there's carbon monoxide leaking into the home and it's likely everyone who walks in here is going to die the bank will do that you know there's a big hole in the roof they may or may not do that it's it's truly health and safety only in order to sell that home okay if, if the contract is written as such that your option period is paid on a daily basis, does that mean the option fee is bigger? How do you pay on a daily basis? Well, because I, I, I noticed in a recent listing that, uh, that they were asking for $25 per day. Now okay. that's what they mean is, what they mean is if you want seven days, then multiply 25 times seven. If you want 10 days, it's 25 times 10. That's what they're meaning. They want a dollar number there. They don't want $25 per day. Okay, so I'm paying say $250 for 10 days. Exactly. And it doesn't matter if it's 20 days because In, of this. Right, in a short sale, it wouldn't matter. Okay. Thank you. Because your option period extends the entire time to the amended. Okay. What I have seen in short sales particularly is the lender takes 60 days to get around to deciding whether they're going to do it or not. And at day 58, the buyer throws his hands in the air and says, forget this. So he's never going to decide. I, I quit. I want my money back. I'm done. You know, that happens quite a bit. And then the lender finally comes back and says, oh, oh, okay, I'll give approval. Sometimes they say, sometimes they don't. But that's why they have that option period the entire time. Okay, any other questions about that? Because the other one I do want to show you is the addendum for the backup contract. And the reason I wanna show that is because I think we're gonna start seeing this more often again. So let me open that one. 
Understand that the days are counted on a backup contract the same way that they are in the short sale. So you can take what I just taught you on that and use it on this one as two. The backup contract is contingent upon the termination of the previous contract. So here's our scenario. I'm the seller. I take an offer and we execute it. Now we have a contract. Then two days later, somebody comes in with a cash offer. It's an excellent deal. It's even better than the one I have. And I get them to agree to be a backup contract. As the seller, I now have a very strong negotiation um, platform because the buyer comes back and says, I want all these repairs. I want everything as if this was a brand new house. Here's seven pages of repairs. I, as the seller, can say, you know what? I'm not doing all these repairs. I'm only going to do this. If you don't like it, fine, terminate. I have another contract waiting in the wings. So it gives the seller a little more power in the negotiation when um, you have a backup contract. And sometimes I have seen a seller who has a great backup contract. It's all cash. It's full price. I don't want any repairs. I don't want anything. It's waiting in the wings. And he flat out tells the person he's under contract with right now, I'm not going to do anything. I really want you to fall out. I've got a better offer. So no, I'm not doing any repairs. I'm not doing anything. I'm not agreeing to anything and I'm not going to pay anything more than what the contract says right this moment. It's a very strong negotiation um, stance uh, if you have a backup contract. So I recommend them. Um, I like it when we have a backup contract because it makes our negotiation stronger. Um, time is of the essence you do have to give uh, the option money and you do have to give the earnest money and they will be cashed so make sure that your buyers understand if they're a backup that it's going to be cashed and they will have to put that money up in, a, in order to have the option period if you look at line b it says if the first contract does not terminate by this date that date can be all the way up to the close of the first contract. It just depends on how dead set your buyer is on getting this home. If he's like, I would really like to have this home, but if I don't get it, I don't get it. I can wait all the way to the end of the contract and put that date there. If he has a certain time frame he needs to move in, however, you might think about, okay, if he's got to move in 60 days, we don't want this to sit here more than 30. Okay. So it really depends on how risk adverse your buyer is, what date you're going to put there. It can be any date up to the actual closing date of the first contract. Okay. And if this does terminate, the buyer gets his earnest money back. He does not get his option money back in, in a short sale, in a backup contract, that option money buys him this long option period, okay? So he doesn't get that money back. Are there any questions about the backup, the backup contract? Uh, Lorraine, I have a question. This is Carrie. Hi, Carrie. What's your question? Hi. Okay, so... Um, I just took, a, I accepted a backup contract on one of my listings this weekend. And Great. I just want to make sure I understand the date. So they put the date um, that, the, that the backup addendum would terminate, basically. It's one day after our option period ends on the first contract. Okay. okay. So if we roll over to this backup contract, do, am I assuming based on the amended effective date in parentheses that we just write an amendment and um, then what do we put on that amendment? I okay. guess my question. I actually was going to show you the form that you would use rather than an amendment. There is a seller's okay. notice to the buyer of the removal of the contingency under the addendum for a backup contract. One of those big long oh, names my. they love. Yes. So okay. basically what it's going to say is according to the backup um, addendum, 
The first contract is terminated. The contract with that buyer is no longer subject to this contingency and the new effective date is amended too. So again, if it just like we did on the short sale, we're gonna put an, a new effective date and the option period will begin again for that for however long your option period is. Okay, so would you mind repeating the name of that for me? Sure. Let me first say this. It is TXR 1913, because that's a lot easier to remember than the seller's notice to buyer of removal of contingency under addendum for backup contract. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. TXR 1913, much easier to say. Lorraine, on the, yes. previous, on the previous form, I heard you say the word that the backup was cash, but I didn't catch the context. Was that mean the backup offer is a cash offer? In, yeah, in the example I gave, I said that the backup offer was a full price cash offer. And we know cash offers are always better than financed offers because lenders can tell us no, cash never says no. But a seller can accept a backup offer that is financed? Absolutely. They just Absolutely. take the risk of it going through or not? I was just giving you the, the um, optimum example. The, the reason my seller would be very hot to take a backup contract it, and my favorite backup contracts are cash. I'm not asking for anything. I don't want any repairs. I just want the property. Full price. Um, and a lot of backup offers are because they know they have to come in strong to be considered. But you can have a financed backup offer. They can ask for repairs or other things. And in multiple offer situations, you might decide, hey, I really like this offer and I really feel like they're a strong buyer, so I'd like to take them as a backup, even though I'm taking this other as the primary contract. Okay, thank you. And I do believe we're gonna see some multiple offer situations based on some of the things that, um, um, I was listening to Dr. Gaines from the Real Estate Center at A&M and he was, he's an economist. I think I said that right, I hope. Um, anyway, um, he's, he's one of the best in the state. And he was telling us that home prices are actually going up and the um, supply in the Houston area is at five months. Um, and he's not anticipating that listings are going to get, you know, suddenly everybody's going to list their home and we're going to have an, a glut. So he's kind of bucking the conventional wisdom and he's done that before and been right. So we're kind of thinking, wait a minute, uh, we may be in, in one of those shortages of supply. And if we are, um, we will see the multiple offer situations again. Now that does contend, that does hinge a lot on how soon Texans get back to work. Because the longer they're out of work, the more likely we're gonna have some of those forbearance go into foreclosure, which is gonna change our market again. So that's just something that the economists are looking at right now. And um, with 8.8% of all mortgages in forbearance is something we need to keep in mind. Wow. But I do know that I heard as soon as we got quarantined, oh, you, there's, you know, prices are going down. And, and that was dead wrong because a lot of people took their home off the market or didn't list at this time. And so the supply didn't go up. And if the supply doesn't go up, then the price is not going down. It's, it's uh, the, well, part of the economic formula for determining whether prices are going up or down. The other thing is that we have a very low interest rate right now, and there is talk of it going even further lower in order to help the economy. And if they lower that interest rate, um, he said that he believes it's going to go as low as three 
that's a historical rate. And if it does go to that, you are going to see massive refinancing. For people who financed at 4.5 or 4.25, going down to three is a whole point and a quarter down. So um, that was some really good information. Um, I have two more forms that I want to talk about, and then I'll let you tell me if there's anything you want to talk about. Um, also on the call with Dr. Gaines was J.C. Johnson, who is a real estate lawyer here in the city of Houston. And one of the things that he, talk about, he talked about is real estate agents and our um, ongoing responsibility to protect the public. So even though we're starting to come out of quarantine and even though there'll be more in-person open houses, which just opened for us yesterday, and even though we're going to be able to walk through houses again, it doesn't lessen our legal responsibility to attempt to protect the public from itself. I, I know that's a mouthful, but that's how he put it. So this um, COVID-19 certificate of property access if you have a listing, I would recommend to you that you continue using this form for anyone who comes into the house in order to mitigate some of that liability. Basically what this form says is to the best of my knowledge, I've not been exposed, I don't have, I've not been tested or my test came back negative for the COVID-19 virus. So that the seller has a little bit of assurance that the people coming into their home whether they're um, buyers, whether they're uh, real estate agents, inspectors, appraisers, anybody who's coming in, um, it gives them a little assurance that they, there's not an issue with the COVID-19. Because even though we're coming out of quarantine, that risk still does exist. And the lawyers are recommending that we mitigate that risk with this form. Um, another form that we still can use um, is the actual COVID-19 addendum. You can't make anybody use this, and I can't stress that enough. You can't tell the buyers and sellers this is mandatory because it's not. And Trek and uh, Mr. Johnson reiterated, you can't make this mandatory. What it does for the buyer and seller is it gives them a little bit of assurance um, that this will close even if COVID-19 interrupts things if anyone who's associated with the um, transaction is quarantined, um, we get an automatic 30-day extension on the closing. They don't have to do an amendment. They don't have to do anything. It gives an automatic delay of 30 days. Um, can they close before that 30-day period is up? Yes, they can, but it automatically extends it for that full 30 days. And if at that time, after that 30 days, they are still not able to close because somebody is quarantined or affected by the COVID-19, then um, the contract will terminate. There will be no liability to the buyer or the seller and the earnest money will be refunded to the buyer. Also, in paragraph two, it says that if the buyer is not able to fund their loan and close because of the buyer's loss of income, then either party, buyer or seller, can terminate this contract and the earnest money will go back to the buyer. Okay. So, so Lorraine. Yes. On the previous form, uh, certification of property access, if we have an in-person open house, say this weekend, should we have a stack of these forms for all the visitors to sign? Yes, you should. Okay. Before they come in, they need to let you know whether they've been exposed, they've had it, they've been quarantined, whatever. Um, or even they, they went to, to any area where it was a hot spot. All of those things have to be disclosed before they come in. And you do have the right to refuse entry to anyone who is actively have COVID-19 or is supposed to be in quarantine. Um, and, and that protects your seller. Another thing is if you're doing an in-person open house, I suggest you take Clorox wipe, wipe things down after each person who goes through, maintain your social distancing, all of those things that we're supposed to do during this time. 
Okay. Okay. Any other questions about this form? Okay, great. We have a few minutes here and I'm going to open up for questions and I'm going to open up for, give me a second, I'm coming up with my list of all the addendums that we actually have. Um, if there's any addendum that you have a question about, I'll be happy to answer that right now. I hear somebody talking, but they're, they may be talking to somebody else. Lorraine, uh, this is yes. Carrie. Again, um, I had to jump off for a minute, so I apologize if what I'm about to ask is redundant. But Not a um, I, back to the backup addendum, I just want to be clear that we can only accept one backup addendum. Is that correct? No. No, it's not. You can how have a backup you, to a backup. How do you indicate if it's a backup? Like, do you have to indicate that it's like offer one, two, and three? Like, how do you? Yeah, you would have to indicate at some two. point, you know, this is the first one, this is the second backup, this is the third backup, but I have seen that in multiple offer situations where they take multiple backups as well. Um, how, it's how would I it's very it? rare that you're going to have more than two because the further you get from it, the less likely that person is to ever get the home. Yeah, true. I do though. I did receive two backup offers and I just told the last one, like, we'll just keep you in mind. Like I, I didn't yeah. do anything with it. And, and that really is the seller's choice. The seller could say, yeah, I want 15 backup orders. We'll just boom, boom, boom. If one falls out, the next one's dominoes. But um, realistically, I, I wouldn't want to keep a buyer and, and I would probably tell my seller, one backup, two backups, max. You don't really want a whole bunch of people waiting in line because they're going to lose some of that enthusiasm for one and uh, probably break out of it. You know, they all yeah. have option periods. They're not going to stick around right. forever. So. Question. Yes. If, if you have two backups, the first one falls out or the first contract falls out. Do you have an option of choosing number one or number two? No, backups? you have to take them in order. Okay. Yes, that's why you have to it's somehow distinguish this is my first backup, this is my second. It gets very confusing and don't really recommend it, but I have seen it happen. Would that go uh, like a statement and special provisions, for example? Um, yes, it would be a statement that's pertinent to that particular contract. Um, Okay. Thank I know it's a rare situation, but yeah, I found myself in it. So thank you. You're welcome. That mm -hmm. I'm thinking about that special provisions thing because um I would also at some point have to terminate that special provision. Mm-hmm. Let me look at something. I'm not a big fan of them, as you know. <laughs> Let's see when I when I cancel that backup. Where's that form? Seller's notice to remove it. Okay, it actually does amend the contract when you release that. So it would, it would amend that statement as well. I would not put it in a normal backup. I would not write anything in special provisions. But, but if it were the second backup. I would. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, I would then. Because normally in, in your backup, you have the backup addendum who's going to cover everything, but you're talking mm -hmm. about an additional layer here. So you might have mm -hmm. to write just a statement of fact, no ifs, ands, or buts. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. 
Okay. Uh, Leslie had a good question. Yes. If, if you have a home you're inherited, now I don't know if this is someone she's listing or herself, and you don't have all the information about the house to disclose, you want to put the house on the market, do they still do a seller's disclosure? Is, um, if it's not in a trust, do they still do the seller's disclosure? If it's in a trust, do they not? An estate is exempt from giving a seller's disclosure. Heirs do not have to give one. The only reason they might want to give one is if they do know something. You know, if you know mama is called a plumber um, multiple times because there's something wrong with the bathroom in the master bedroom and you've talked to your mom about, okay, I'll get you another plumber out there. We'll get this fixed and it's still not working right. You know something. So I would go ahead and fill one out under the, the thought that even though I don't have to, I want to disclose everything that I do know because I am responsible for that. And say okay. unknown on the things you don't know. You don't know what you don't know, but if you do know something, you're still liable for that if they were to sue you, okay? Let's say the buyer says, okay, well, I bought this, it, it was an estate, but they knew that this plumbing leaked. They knew it and they sold it without telling me. That's where the, the sticky part comes in. So if you know something, just disclose, um, even though you're not required to fill out a seller's disclosure. It's just the best form that we have, even in, in the situation where you're the heir and you don't know much, but you know that one thing, it's still the best form we have. All right, guys, are there any other questions? Any other form you want me to touch on real quick? Let's see, form number I just saw. Hang on one sec. Yeah, there we go. Okay, there isn't a form number for the model certification for property address. Just go look up, I typed in COVID-19 and all the forms for COVID-19 come up in, in DocuSign um, in dot loop and in zip forms. Um, all three times, all I did is put in the word COVID and up they came. So you'll find it because it's, its name is actually model certification. It's not just certification. Let's see, where is it? Here, COVID-19 certification of property address. But when you open it, it's called model COVID-19 certification. And that's how it's actually listed in a lot of places. Okay. It is the model. They never made it where you, um, where it was an official form. So there is no, there's no number on it. All right, guys, if you have no more questions, no other form you want me to go over at this time, I'm going to go ahead and Lorraine, I'm sorry. On this, uh, yes. property access. Uh, going back yes. to the scenario of an open house, do you have every person sign it or just one member of the party? I would have them all sign it. Okay. I, I'm trying to protect my seller. I'm trying to protect myself. So I would have everybody who comes into the open house sign it. Now, if they have their children with them, they can, you know, list their children's name. But right now, I don't think it's a really good idea to have a whole bunch of children running around in a open house. Right, right. No. But this is not just for open houses. Um, once you're under contract, anyone who's coming in, whether they're doing an inspection, an appraisal, uh, a repairman who's coming into the home, all of those people need to fill this form out. So yeah, I would give my seller a stack of them if I needed to so that when they're there, they can have somebody fill that out before they come in. Well, let me rethink that because this is only used by a Texas realtor. You would have to be there to give it to them before they could come in the home. I will say, um, I wish we could leave them in the home because as you're showing properties, it, it's just another layer of activity that has to be completed to get into a house. And when you're showing multiple homes in a day, it's just so cumbersome. Now, if you have the buyer, and even if the seller hasn't asked for it, 
I, I would carry some of these around with me. I would go ahead and fill it out and you could leave it for the seller's agents to show yeah. that, hey, we're I have certifying seen, I have had, I've had listing agents that won't confirm or won't allow us in the house until we provide this signed ahead of time and email it back over. I can see that. Yeah. So in that case, you have your buyers go ahead and fill it out and then you just email it over to them and yeah, I just have it like a, it shouldn't yeah. be a problem. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, that's probably the easiest way to do it. If you have buyers is to just go ahead and have it filled out so that, you know, you have it on your phone and you can just shoot it over there whenever you go to see a house. Cause I know sometimes when I was out showing houses, uh, they would say, Hey, I want to see that one too. And we'd call real quick and be able to get in 15, 20 minutes. So if I had it on my phone, I'd be able to send it over to that agent real quick. All right, guys, I thank you for attending. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to email me at lbenick, B-E-N-N-I-N-K, at kw.com. And y'all have a great day.